Uh, we're very fortunate this morning to have with us Federico Pistono as this morning's speaker. Federico is a social entrepreneur. Some of you met him last or yesterday, didn't you, at the, one of the tables? Um, but he's also um, an author, quite a successful author, um, and an award-winning journalist. Um, as some of you will have picked up, he's also um, uh, written a book called Robots Will Steal Your Job, but that's okay, reassuringly. He is here today, this morning, to talk to us about education, following up on our promise to deliver internet for all. He's going to talk about education for all. Thank you. Okay, so welcome everyone. And I will try to make this work. So uh, this is not to say that my presentation is great, but um, I'm going to give you some tips on how to make a great presentation, because you're going to have to make great presentations if you want to start your social business or uh, your project or your startup or your nonprofit. Whatever you're going to start, you need to make great presentations. The first thing, you need to be well rested. So in the last three days, I slept uh, exactly four hours, two hours two days ago and two hours yesterday. So. Um, it's a good start. You, it needs to be crafted and well polished. So you need to know exactly what you're saying, the timing to the second. I changed all of my presentation last night at 4 a.m. Um, and don't ever reference your own presentation. So now that I broke every single rule of making a great presentation, I can deliver mine. <laughs> um, this is my company. It's called Esplori. And um, before I speak about that, actually, I want to give you a little bit of context. Because uh, right now I'm in New York, I have this great company, we, um, we have a team, I travel the world and give speeches everywhere, Fortune 500 companies, TED events. Um, but before that, I was just a tiny little kid in this uh, northern Italy uh, town. Um, and as you can see, I was the toughest and the biggest uh, of all, so <laughs> um, it was a really good time. Um, I was about to drop out from the traditional education because uh, the educational school, the educational system, and my school in particular, but I and then experienced almost every school, um, had some major issues. And one of them was that it was not fostering your creativity uh, and the innate curiosity that we all have. And so I, I reached the age of 16 and I thought, this, this is not working out for me, I'm, I might as well drop out. And plus, I was told that I was stupid and that I wouldn't even be able to make it. So um, all of this was going on. And, and then one guy walks in a day saying, hey, you know there is this school called the United World College where basically it's like this dreamlike place where there are no grades, um, classes are non-compulsory, there are no tests, and you can do whatever you want, essentially. You can follow your own courses make your own curriculum, and you live together between the age of 16 and 18 with 200 people from 85 different countries. And you can only get in through a scholarship. No one makes their way in via money. And so I was like, wow, OK, I need to, get to be there. And um, against all odds, there were thousands of applicants. Uh, all of my teachers, you know, the ones I said I was stupid, they said you, should, you shouldn't even apply. I applied, thousands of applicants, there were 10 getting a scholarship, and I got in. So I spent two years between the age of 16 to 18 in this magical place. And the goal was to make education a force to unite people, nations and cultures, for peace and a sustainable future. So I think it's very fit that we are going to the Nobel Peace Prize because it feels very much in the same vein. And um, this is the idea that I had when I was uh, in school. <laughs> No, not really, but, uh, <laughs> but um, what they told us basically was um, if you believe you can make a change in the world, a positive change in the world, and you have a plan and you act on it, then you can do it. Right? It's not a hippie dream. It's not wishful thinking. You can actually do it because people have done it before. And now we have more opportunity than ever because we are interconnected. So... I went back to normal school or traditional uh, education system to a university in Italy, which was a very good university. I studied computer science and artificial intelligence. I got my degree and blah, blah, blah. But for me, it was really a, a shock, a culture shock, going back to a system where basically you had to force your way in through grades and 
studying for the exam and trying to pinpoint which kind of questions were there, how to make the perfect examining craft. And question number one is usually this one. And so you, you go back five years and you look at all the exam of the previous five years every semester. And you know this because you've done it, right? You're doing it maybe now. Um, and, and it was dreadful because where was the learning? Where was the passion? Where was the uh, intention? It was just getting a grade to get the piece of paper to get a job. I mean, what? To me, it made no sense. So I started looking out. And I was one of the first people to discover Khan Academy, and I was flabbergasted. Uh, and even before Khan Academy, MIT up opened the open courseware. And so I was following courses online, and even though the connection was still very slow and um, I could only download videos, uh, you know, take, it took days to download a few videos, a video course, but I could follow courses from MIT for free. That was amazing. So, and, and then, in the last few years, we've seen all these other uh, great institutions and companies and startups like Coursera. They're taking essentially the best universities, the best teachers, making courses specifically for the web and putting them online for free. Um, I was one of the first students to follow the machine learning course from Stanford um, by Andrew Ang, who then started Coursera. This was uh, two and a half years ago. It was the first course before the artificial intelligence course by Peter Norwig and, um, uh, and the Sebastian Thron that made the news, the headlines. And Joanne actually started this one before that, and I was in the first batch of students. So I saw this great opportunity that was rising from the web uh, between open content, great universities, great professors, and technologies that allowed for the distribution of this knowledge. Um, edX, it's another uh, organization doing this with, you can see Harvard, Berkeley, Rice University, um, and there are many others. Some of them are commercial, some of them are free, some of them are open source, some of them are uh, non-profits, but I saw that this huge change that was sweeping completely the landscape of the educational system. Um, and I was very excited. And simultaneously, after writing the book, Robots Will Steal Your Job, but that's okay, which, by the way, you can read for free on the website, because they live in open knowledge. Um, I heard about this magical place again, called Singularity University. It's inside the NASA Ames Research Park in Silicon Valley, Mountain View, in California. And the goal is to positively impact it's called 10 to the 9th plus, more than 1 billion people in less than a decade. So how do you leverage exponentially growing technologies to make a positive impact in the world that will help or empower a billion people or more in less than a decade? So that was the vision. And that was coincidentally the same vision that I had for years, but I had no resources, no money, no connection, nothing. And so suddenly when I saw this mission, I saw just a brief video, like a three-minute video on YouTube, and there was Larry Page um, saying, if I were a student, this is where I would want to be. The co-founder of Google saying, this is the place to be if you want to make a great change in the world. And I was like, okay, I have to apply. And again, you're stupid, you're not going to make it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, thousands of people apply, only 80 get in. I applied and I got a full scholarship and I got in last summer. I went through the 10-week program, and I graduated. And from there, my whole world changed uh, because, because of the connections and because of the um, experience that I, I've earned from other people. Right? So it's not about what you can do. It's what you can do with others. And this is the mission. How can I positively impact billions of people? So I've been thinking about that, and I've been thinking about my whole formative experience going from... Um, disillusioned uh, school in a small village uh, in the north of Italy to uh, this magical place of changing the world and making peace on earth through education, and then going back to uh, the traditional system with university and getting my degree and being bored to death, and then uh, finding alternative ways to learn, and seeing all of that, and, and because of the experience and the path that I went through, and then Singularity University, 
10 to the 9th impact, I thought, how can I have this kind of impact in the world? And, um, and I thought about learning. Learning is such a huge, powerful tool. Learning is what emancipates entire populations. Learning is what makes everything possible. If you don't learn, if you don't have an educated population, then pretty much you can do nothing. Um, and it starts from the basics. Um, and the more, an the, the, I, don't, I don't like to use the word education because it, feel that it feels like something that's imposed on you, like something dreadful, like something you, you're, you're compelled to receive even if you don't want it or even if you want it slightly in a different way. But learning is completely different. Learning is something you do because of some drive that you have, right? You're interested in something, you're like, that's cool. I want to learn about that. So you go and learn. You don't receive an education, you learn about something. And so I've been speaking around the world, but um, you know, traveling and all, and I've asked in every country that I went to, in the last two years, I traveled to more than 20 countries in four continents. I asked, what do you do? What's your passion? What's your, what's your life like? Uh, what are the problems you encounter? How would you improve your life if you had access to certain tools or certain people or certain technologies or certain policies were changed in your country? How would your life and the life of your community and your family and your friends would be better if certain things were different? And what would they be? So I asked, and these are some of the takeaways that I uh, found out based on my experience and the experience of all the people that I asked to from all these different countries. Um, the first problem that I encountered is that you might have noticed all of those countries, sorry, all of those companies are San Francisco, Silicon Valley. Right? They're all in America and they all speak English. And with the exception of the Khan Academy and very timidly Coursera right now, they are all just in English. It's one language. And you might say, well, who cares? Now everyone speaks English. I'm speaking English. You are an international audience. Why should we care? Well, only 6% of the world speaks English. Th there is no zero missing. It's 6%. 6% 6 speaking, speaks English natively. And then you might say, OK, but that's just native speakers. If you take people who speak some sort of English, it surely is like 70%, 80%. Now, actually, 73% of the world speaks zero English. They don't speak a single word. They might understand hello, love, bye-bye, and Coca-Cola. That's it. 73%, that's almost 5 billion people. So, look at that pie chart. I mean, if you have a company, or an organization, or a nonprofit, or anything, and you're only concerned with English, and you don't think about the native language of the people you're trying to reach. Essentially, you're saying, all of those people, we don't care. They don't care. And this is actually what a senior executive of a very famous and very important Silicon Valley company, which I will not mention, but it's on the top 20 of the world. He said, we don't need to talk to these people because all of the people who matter speak English. So when I heard that, I was like, Something is definitely wrong with, with this guy and the whole culture around this guy. Uh, and I say this guy because I don't think a woman would have said that. Um, <laughs> the second problem is that um, although they, they are great, these resources, and I've learned a lot from them and I, I like to follow their courses, the reality is 90% of the people drop out within three months after starting a course. Why? Why do people drop out who follow Massimo Line Open Courses? Well, you guys, you are under 25, right? So you are either in school or you were in school not so long ago. Where did you do most of your learning? Was it when you were listening to the lecture? Or was it rather when you were studying in a small study group, usually three to five people, after the lecture, when you were trying to figure out with your friends how that thing worked? Why was it this way and not the other way? Right? Most of the learning happens when you're trying to figure things out with your friends, with a small study group. So why is it not a built-in function, a main function of the website when you enroll to a course? You are immediately put into a study group or suggested a number of study groups, maybe based on your native language, since 90% of the people who follow Massive Online Open Courses don't speak English as a native language. You might find yourself better suited to study 
in a small group of people who speak the same language as you natively. Even though the course might be in English, you'd be much better off if you're studying your native language because that's how you emotionally connect with people. And then there is a, a huge aspect, which is mentorship. In my experience, mentorship was the single most important factor. So having great people who can inspire uh, and give me advice, who can direct me and guide me. It's, all, it's because of all the mentors that I had and all the connections that I've made at the human level that made me who I am today. If I didn't have them, I would have made a billion mistakes and you know, banged my head against the wall a thousand times and instead, I only banged my head a hundred times, which is, you know, significantly, it's an order of magnitude better. <laughs> so um, another problem is that the tools are not available to all. So you might say, what do you mean? There's this company doing this, this company doing that. You can upload a video to YouTube. You can go to Skillshare and make a course. You can go to blah, blah, blah. Yes, the individual components are available. But there is no website that takes all of these resources the resources to um, create a video course, to make it available in any language, from any source language, and translate it into any other language, to have study groups built in, to have the ability to collaborate on same projects and not just follow a course and answer multiple choice questions, um, and to spread that knowledge anywhere, and to decide if you want to make the course free, if you want it to make at a cost, if you want it open source, if you want to keep the rights. There is no website that makes all of these tools available for free to anyone. So the complete flat platform doesn't exist yet. And in my mind, learning is not democratized yet. But it could be. And that's why I started uh, Explory, to make all of these tools available to all. And to leave free people the freedom to use them however they prefer. Right, so, so this is my goal. Uh, Explory means to seek out knowledge. And the mission is to make all of the world's knowledge available to anyone on Earth regardless of their language, geographical location, or financial status. And it begins with making the tools available to anyone. So this is my mission, and this is what drives me and keeps me awake 22 hours a day, as you can see. <laughs> because learning is forever. Learning is not age 6 to 25. Learning is all of your life, especially in this ever-connected world and ever-changing world, now almost exponentially changing, and robots are taking our jobs, so you have to keep learning. Whether you're 50, whether you're a subsistence farmer in the sub-Saharan Africa, whether you are a, an engineer in Silicon Valley, it doesn't matter, you have to keep learning. And what better way to learn, if not with a democratized tool that's available to all in your native language and you can access from any device. So um, that's a little bit of context uh, of my experience and my company, but here are some lessons that might be useful for you. As young social entrepreneurs who are starting just now, uh, here are some advice, some lessons that I've learned that uh, might be useful for you. So when you're going through a cycle of development, you always identify a problem, find a solution, and then you execute, and then you iterate. Um, Specifically, you try to do it as fast as you can. So instead of having six months or a year development cycle, you have tried to have a two-week development cycle or a one-week development cycle and see in testing and testing and testing, scientific method, lean approach. But to make this possible, you need some conditions. And the first is I think you should work on something meaningful because at the end of the day, if you are, if you, if, if you are very smart or very capable or very, um, you have a lot of grit, it doesn't matter what you do, you will make a living, you will make money, you will be hired by you know, the best companies, whatever. But the difference that will make between working for this company, working for this other company, or making your organization, or making a for-profit, making a non-profit, the difference is if you're working on something meaningful or not. Right? If you're waking up every day thinking, this is what I have to do. This is what will make people's lives better. This is what gives me meaning. Because this is the difference between something that will keep you on track for a few months or maybe a couple of years, or something that will last throughout your lifetime. And even if you're doing a different job or you're changing company, it will always be 
the back of your mind that that was your mission. And you may approach it from many different angles, but it will always be one of your core components because it, it aligns with your values, right? What it means for you to be human and to be, um, when I say successful, I mean something that gives you meaning in life, right? I don't think success, anyone here thinks success is to make a lot of money. I think here everyone thinks success is to make a positive impact for others. And what better way now if not to start a social enterprise? So this was my mission, and that's what I'm doing. Um, and then you listen, listen, listen. Okay? So don't go try to solve somebody else's problem thinking you know what their problem is and what their solution should be. Um, most likely you don't. Neither you, do, you know what the problem is, neither you know what the solution should be. And that's why aid in Africa has failed miserably for the last 30 years. Because we had this white uh, bourgeois who went to Africa and said, we're going to save you. And the Africans were like, uh, what? Well, first of all, you know, it's, it, the, the, this, this idea of saving someone, there is nothing to, there is no one to save. There is empowerment, okay? There is access. There is opportunity. That's why I believe in equal access, equal opportunity. People can make their own fortune and their, 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 their own meaning in life, and if you have pity for them and you give them you know, money or you give, you give stuff to them, you're basically saying, you are less than me. But they are not. They're just like you. They were just born in a different country that had less opportunity. So give them the opportunity. Don't give them the money. Don't give them stuff. You have to treat them with respect because they know best on how to find their local solutions. You might empower them by giving them suggestions or access to certain resources, but they have a dignity just like you. So listen, listen, listen. So I went around the world, and even here I'm only speaking. Um, that's because it's hard to find people taking pictures of you when you're listening. But I can assure you I was listening. <laughs> I wasn't just speaking. So I went around the world asking people. And then you have to dream big. If you're not dreaming big, you will not make anyone excited. If you want to put a ding in the universe, People will follow that. People will be inspired by that, and they will join you. If you want just to make, make the next quarter profits, or if you want to change a small, if you want to make the new phone app for taking pictures and sharing with you with your friends, or nobody will be inspired by that. Nobody will stay with you for two, three years, or, or more. You have to dream big. And that's what I did. But you also have to be pragmatic. Because I, I see many people who dream big and they have these amazing ideas and then they can't deliver because they are not down to earth and they're not looking at the problems and they can't uh, find the right collaborators to, to work with. Which brings me to the next point, you're not alone. You might think that you know, it all rests on your shoulders, you are the CEO or you are the founder and your idea is the idea and that's how you're going to do it and that's the only way and it's perfect in your head. No, it's not. <laughs> you need to be challenged. You need advice. You need mentorship. You need guidance. You need co-founders. You need collaborators. You need local people working in situ. That's in the local place where you're trying to help. If you don't work with the local people, if you don't uh, get feedback from your customers or your users or uh, the people you're, you're trying to reach, you, you won't get anything done. Okay? You're not alone. And relying on someone else is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength. It's a sign of strength specifically knowing which person is right for which kind of job and how can they help you and how you can help them. Because in the end, it's always every relationship, it's about giving, right? In love, in business, in nonprofits, in family, it's always about giving. How, what can I give you to be happy? If you have that attitude, they will join you. And if you are, what can I take from you? Yeah, people will start to look away, and rightly so, because they will look for someone who is a giver, not a taker. Um, 
speaking of um, giving and taking and not relying just on yourself, I'm announcing a new book called The Open Source Society that I just launched today. It's a collaborative book project. So this is the premiere of uh, the new book, which will also be on Creative Commons and will be free. Um, I'm trying to find actionable items and ideas for companies, governments, and local communities and individuals to apply to smooth and ease the transition towards a more sustainable society, not just at the environmental level, but the social level for income redistribution, for um, public health, for um, our inequality, for uh, psychosocial stress, everything. Uh, if you have ideas on actionable items, that means either policy level or things companies can do or things people and communities can do, then you're more than welcome to join the project. And um, you can, it's a Google moderator, so you can put on your suggestion, you can vote other people's suggestions, and you can share it with, with others so that they might have an idea. And I think you know, uh, something really nice will come out of this because of the uh, intelligence of many is always greater than the intelligence of one. So I'm also relying on you guys and everyone else to join the project. And since the book will be available also for free, I hope this will help um, spread out uh, a good outcome and a good insight of what the future could be like in a very pragmatic way. So dream big, but be pragmatic. And this, I think, encapsulates that idea as well. This is the website, opensourcesociety.net. Um, go and visit it and join the project. Um, and I know that even though, you know, when I look back into my past and I see, you know, this wimpy little kid in a small town doing now all these things around the world and living in New York and blah, 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 there is always something more to be done. When I look at what I'm doing now, as I expand my network and I see what others are doing, I realize that I haven't done really anything that big yet. Because um, how many people have, uh, have I empowered or helped? Maybe a few dozens or hundreds of thousands. There is 7 billion plus in the world, 7.2 billion uh, heading for 9 billion. How many of them can I reach with the help of others? And how many of them can I inspire? And what can I give to you and to others? So this is the question that I ask myself every day and then I try to live by. And the more I give, the more I realize I have more to give. And everyone has to give something and wants to give something because life is about sharing and sharing is caring. So uh, there is a lot more to be done. Let's get to it. Thank you. All right, so um, any questions or any... We still have 10, 15 minutes. So take the opportunity before we need to be upstairs, okay? okay. So think, so about, think about maybe what, what you are doing. doing. Either you, you already have a project or you're thinking of a project. Um, any question you might have on how to... Yes? Uh, your biggest mistake or failure. My biggest, biggest mistake. mistake. Ooh, so many. Uh, let's see. Um, yes, my biggest mistake was to... Uh, not start earlier. I, I really began my transformation when I was 13 and I started to program computer. Um, and that was my way of basically trying to solve a problem with very little resources because suddenly you had this tiny little box that cost uh, a thousand euros and you could make amazing things. You could tell it, solve this problem and now do it a billion times. Bam, go. And it was just the cost of electricity. So that was amazing. Uh, but I started very late in my mind. 13, I was already, you know, old. Uh, <laughs> and um, you guys, you guys have an opportunity that no one had before in history. Okay, in, in the history of humanity, no one has ever had, even remotely, the opportunity that you have. Think of all of the, you, you guys are um, native digitals, digital natives. Uh, you were born in a culture where internet was a given in most places, and even in remote villages and remote areas, it was something that you could attain by um, driving somewhere or going with the bicycle to the closest coffee shop. Or, um, 
So think of the opportunity for interconnectedness and the ability to reach out to uh, now 4 billion people connected to the internet instantly. So seize the opportunity, seize the moment, carpe diem. Right, right. Uh, yeah, again, there are so many people. Um, I think, well, first of all, my parents did not, uh, op did not put me any obstacles. When I, when I said I want to go to this place, they were like, okay, apply. And I'm like, ah, I want to go there, and I'm like, okay, go. <laughs> Um, so that was, that was amazing, right? And, um, and more than that, they gave me the, the, the greatest gift that a child could have, which is you know, unconditional love, something you can always rely on. And that, I think, is the basis for uh, your emotional and psycho psychological stability. And then from there, it was, it was one teacher who believed in me, who wrote me the application form for the college. Um, and then uh, so many great great people that I met at the United World College, that, 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 that was really a game changer for me. And from there, you know, from a Singularity University, now I have a group of uh, five mentors that I meet with every month. Uh, it's called Life Goals Day. I suggest you do this. You find three to five people in your life that you are either good friends with or you want to have a deeper relationship. And you ask them one hour a month where you meet, either on Skype or on phone or in person, and you talk about your life goals. And what I mean by that is you have a list of things you want to achieve within the next month and things you want to achieve within the next 20 years. So every month you keep track of the last month, but you keep an eye on your 20-year goal to see if you're deviating and you're just being transported by the emotions through inertia or you're actually moving towards your goal, right? Something that gives you meaning. So I have to, thanks, to thank all of these people and more. It's, uh, it's a very long list. Yes? Which was the first course that was available on Explorer? The first course available on Explorer. So we are still developing the, the platform, but you already, we already have a, a number of content partners. So when we come out with the public beta, we'll already have hundreds of courses. Um, so I don't think there will be the first course, but the first batch of courses will be a few hundred courses maybe a few thousand even, because we have some, for instance, we have a content partner in South America that has 10,000 videos already. So that's about, you know, um, about a thousand courses uh, just in there. And we have about 10 partners already uh, in, in the content space and uh, some 15 partners in, yeah. No, 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 not everything is for free. The tools are available for free. If you create a course, you can decide, I want this course for, to to be put on for free, or this course will cost five dollars or five euros, but you decide it because you are the content creator. I'm making the tools available, and you can decide uh, whatever is best for you. Yes. Can you explain a little bit about your business model mm -hmm. and uh, also what is your uh, funding uh, plans and situation? Yeah. So we are doing an angel round. Uh, you, are you guys all familiar with angel round? It's the first round before the Series A. It's basically uh, some retired, um, not necessarily retired, but some wealthy individual who usually are retired, maybe even in their 30s. They have come out with a good exit, uh, usually with a startup in Silicon Valley or elsewhere. And they have a few millions to spare. And every year they put up to usually 10% of their wealth. It fluctuates, but that's about. And they say, okay, I'm going to fund these startups for a couple of hundred thousand, for you know, 400,000, 500,000. So we are doing an angel round now, and we have a couple of investors uh, from uh, the United States, another possible investor in uh, Egypt, and one in London uh, that we're talking to. And the, um, the business model is to, um, to have corporate training, white label, and that's where most of the money will probably come in. Uh, so that we can fuel our social endeavor of giving the tools available to anyone. Uh, simultaneously, if you put a course and you, and you say this is $10 or 10 euros, uh, we take a fee out of that, so it's Kickstarter model. There is a crowdfunding, crowdsourcing uh, system within the platform for creating the courses. So even there, there is a fee and 
for the courses that are free, they're just free. And we might have Amazon referrals uh, as, uh, since, since you have text transcribed as a built-in function, you have contextual links uh, that are referred specifically to certain items. So you, you, you can put not advertisement, but referrals, which is we don't want any advertisement. We want, at the most, some specific referrals that have a contextual reference. Um, and from that, you get, again, uh, a referral fee. So uh, there are many ways to, to, to monetize unobtrusively uh, content once you have a large community of dedicated individuals who are fueling the content. Yes? Yeah, excellent question. So um, we will know the answer to that when we finish our pilot program, which will run for three months after the, the end of our um, MVP cycle, minimum viable product. Um, my guess is that um, w since we, we're giving the tools for free and they're all available to all, you make your course, you have your private URL, and you can share that course with your friends on social media or email. If you want your course to be taken into consideration, to be in the public archives, then you can say, I apply to be considered. And then a staff of editors will evaluate your course and, for, and check for quality and then add it to the public archives. So it will be in the listings of staff picks or editor picks uh, for the website. This is my guess but we'll see how that goes exactly when, when we actually start. Yes? Someone else? Yeah. 20 years. <laughs> you want my goals? <laughs> um, I'll tell you a few of them, because some of them are very private. <laughs> so um, I will have um, positively impacted um, more than one billion people, hopefully with this company, uh, maybe win another one because you know failure is always an option. Uh, <laughs> and um, so that's one. I will have directed uh, my film. Uh, I, I wrote a feature film uh, four years ago. I, I mean, I've been a filmmaker too. I've, I've directed short films and documentaries and and, and other things, uh, especially for companies and film festivals. But I, I wrote actually a feature film that I need maybe five million to, to produce. So as soon as I have five million to spare, I'll, I'll make the movie. It's about social change through um, social engineering and hacking and revolution and uh, kind of, I don't know, WikiLeaks meets Anonymous meets The Matrix. <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, yeah. And, and then I will have started a family, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes? Do you have any role model? Who do you look up to? Oh, many people. Uh, Salman Khan. I actually have a, a web page on my website that says personal heroes. Um, Salman Khan, who started the Khan Academy, he's one of my, my role models, my heroes. Um, uh, then Marcin Jakubowski started open source ecology. Uh, are you guys familiar with open source ecology? OK, you have to check this out. OK, you have to. There is no other option. Um, he started. Um, six years ago, this organization, it's, a, it's an open source project to create the Global Village Construction Set. So it's a set of 50 industrial machines. It's a toolkit for starting a civilization. So you could be dropped anywhere in a semi-fertile land in the world with a laptop or a smartphone. And, and suddenly, you have all the knowledge required to create an entire modern civilization with all comforts you can imagine. An electric car, a house, a system for um, separating the aluminum out of the soil, for processing, for making bricks, uh, for building a hydroponic garden, for anything you can imagine to survive and thrive in any environment from scratch with just a community of few people that can scale up to any size. That's his dream. And he actually built uh, about 20 of these 50 machines already. Right, so check out Open Source Ecology and Marcin Jakubowski is the guy who started it. Um, another one is uh, Elon Musk, who's basically um, Tony Stark in real life. Uh, so I, 
you guys all know Elon Musk, right? SpaceX, Tesla, Solar City. I don't think I have to mention anymore. Um, and uh, yeah, and Carl Sagan. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So um, that depends on your definition of the singularity. But um, if by singularity you mean when machines essentially exceed human intelligence in every respect, then I think it's inherently unknowable because we can't predict what a superhuman intelligence will do because, well, we are human. We are not superhuman. So um, what I'm concerned about is between now and then, right, the transition that I think will define most likely, the values that the machines will develop, because since they will interact with us, we have a good chance that they will develop a certain ethical standard based on our, the interactions with us, so based on our value system. So if our value system is all messed up, they might try to do the same thing that we are doing, that we have done with, to, the ne to the Neanderthals, that we have done to the Native Americans, that we have done, and they will just exterminate us. Because that's what we've been doing. We are so successful exterminating people who are just slightly different than us. Um, and if we change our values and we create a more peaceful, sustainable civilization, they might acquire the same values and actually elevate us to a, a higher transcendence level. So um, that's why I, I wrote a new, another book called, uh, this, this is a fiction book called A Tale of Two Futures. and tells the story of two separate futures, one where things go really bad and the other where things go very well, so it's a more of a Star Trek future. Um, so yeah, I'm interested in the transition. Uh. Okay guys, I think we need to end there because we need to make our way up to the cafe again. But before we do that, another round of applause please. Thank you.